to the whole consumption uh, basket and saying, I like this, I don't like that, uh, is first, who's going to make those decisions? The state. Second, how are those state. decisions going to be made? You're going to have enormous lobbying. I mean, you, you're, you, unless you do away with corporations in general, you're going to have a, a, a version of what we had in India, a license permit raj, except this time it's corporations trying to bribe politicians to put They're already their, doing their that. Yeah, but goods <laughs> on the favored list. But, no, but, but you're, 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 you're right. calling up for an enormous increase in this, in this process. And the end result, it's not clear, will be environmentally more sustainable because the guys with the biggest purses will be able to buy the greatest markets for their products by lobbying their favored pro politicians. I mean, how do you work this? But Raghu Rajan, if I read Chandran Nair correctly, what he's saying is that what we've seen over the last few years, maybe more, is a fundamental free market failure. You know, you could argue that the 0708 financial crash was a, a market failure, but even more of a market failure is the failure to address the realities of uh, resource restriction and climate change. And if that's true, if there has been a market failure, then there has to be another way. And I wonder what you think that other way could be. Well, I, I, th I think you're seeing the adaptation slowly. It may not be as fast as people would desire, but in m my uh, sense, it is far more sustainable. For example, in the United States, uh, you don't see Hummers as being uh, socially tolerable anymore. It used to be that the, the Hummer, which was this GM m massive uh, uh, vehicle which consumed uh, atrocious amounts of fuel, uh, people used to drive that and feel proud about it. Now they hide them in their garage. I think those kinds of cultural changes will have far more effect and far more effect in a, uh, in a feasible way, in a way that, that, is, that is reasonable than one where the government suddenly decides to impose uh, sort of restrictions on what you can consume and, and what you can't. So, uh, yeah, so my sense is this, these things happen. I, I, I would, I'm not saying there's no need for government action, but where you want government action, I would rather that it be across the board in more limited ways which allow choices to be made and sensible technologies to be innovated rather than thou shall not and thou shall which to my mind uh, brings in a whole lot more corruption and a whole lot more authoritarianism than we need. And I asked you earlier whether you really felt you were in touch with the, if one can generalize massively, the Asian psyche. And I just wonder whether you think Asians, whether we're talking China, India, or a host of other I, countries, I are really ready for the level of state intervention well, and we, coercion that we, you're talking about. We must about. understand that the consuming classes in Asia are, are still the minority. I mean, give or take a couple of hundred million here and there. Out of a population of over three billion, the consuming classes in Asia are about perhaps half a billion people. So the opportunity, and we, which we need to recognize, is for governments to understand that the current sort of trickle-down Washington consensus that we all bought into post-Second World War, etc., will, will result in catastrophic failure because there's just not enough to go around. 2.5 billion people can't have cars and eat whatever they want. The, the opportunity for Asian governments, be they communist China, or democratic India or you know Malaysia etc is to recognize their legitimacy will depend on dealing with this conundrum smartly the Arab Spring in my view was not about people seeking utopian democracy they were saying where are my basic rights in access to resources and th that will look like a walk in the park in Asia if the governments do not act quickly. And but, the but only way you, to I, take I, people with I disagree you, with Rajan, on, if just, we don't have the time. A, to, to take people with you, Chandran Nair, you're going to have to convince them that you, you, you have an answer. And your answer, it seems to me, this, is, this quote you have of delivering prosperity without growth. Yeah. And I do not understand what you mean by that. How can you have greater prosperity but no growth? Well, we'll have to define what prosperity means. If you define prosperity purely through the acquisition of the, the, the goods and services the multinationals, etc., produce, uh, then that would be a very different prosperity. But prosperity, if prosperity is, in the Asian context over the next uh, 40 years, be one in which three billion Asians, because the population would expand enormously, will have access to what most people don't have today. And this is, this is the very important point. Access to food, safe and secure. Water and sanitation. Today in Asia, more people have access to mobile phones, coming back to externalities, which have been underpriced to the extent that more people have access to mobile phones and toilets and safe water. Education, primary health care, 
and of course housing that's prosperity that, that is and a very that is, that's that's a, a very interesting point mis mistake um, that needs to do that right but, but Mr. Nair, uh, you, you talked about the benefits of cell phones uh, or, or the widespread use of I cell phones. I don't talk about the benefits. One of the reasons is that came from, well, there are benefits. There are now uh, fishermen who can s uh, sell their goods in the markets which pay the higher prices without necessarily being extorted by middlemen. And they can do that because they can find those prices out on their cell phones. But they'll Isn't have no fish to sell to, if you exploit uh, the poor. seas. I mean, I've heard this argument about technology all the time. That is not the issue. Though there, there are know, actually studies which show this, and they, they show that incomes have gone up. Of course if they do. If you are saying that we take away the cell phones in I've India, not said that. and people will be better off, I think, uh, I, I think you have to look at, uh, uh, you no, know. No, I've not but, said but, that. But, 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 but Dr. Raj, you, you have to address one, because you, you, know, you are an advisor to the Indian government, you have to address the fact that while India has seen uh, the rise of a middle class, uh, increase in prosperity, it's also seen uh, a rise in the number of people who are on earning a dollar twenty-five a day or less. I mean, poverty in India is still a fundamental problem and hasn't been solved by the embrace of free market ideologies. It's actually come down. It's come down. It hasn't been wiped out. You're right that, it, uh, you know, it, India should do more on bringing down poverty. But it has come down with growth much faster than in the years where we had the license permit raj and the government determining everything. So markets have worked uh, for India in, 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 in bringing more people out of poverty. The, the other uh, important, uh, I, I think, uh, thing to uh, uh, remember here is that you know much more needs to be done and um, when you ask the average person on the street what they want and this goes back to your earlier point uh, what they want is to embrace uh, this growth now they're not all moving to buying cars at this point they're moving from walking to buying bicycles so some of this growth is actually efficient but not necessarily environmentally uh, very costly now the point that mr nair is making is that everybody consumed at the rate uh, of suburban America, it would be unsustainable, I think is right. But again, uh, I would emphasize we need to ask who has to make the adjustment when and how. A final thought, and it has to be brief. Some of what you say puts me in mind of Thomas Malthus. And in the 18th century, his conviction that human uh, activity and population growth was outstripping the means of the planet to support uh, that, that population rise. You seem to be saying a similar th sort of thing. The problem is Malthus was wrong. Many doomsayers since Malthus have also been wrong because we constantly underestimate human ingenuity, resilience, innovation, and creativity. Are you not in danger of doing just the same thing, particularly from I, the perspective of Asia? I am not doing that at all. Uh, Thomas Malthus was wrong. He just got the timing wrong. And let's also understand that Thomas Malthus said what he said on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. And that, the that's the very point, of isn't it? He could not conceive he of could the not shift in technology of a different that was about to come and maybe you can't either. No, but he did not conceive of the, the shift of technology in terms of where fossil fuels were going, etc. And the game has not been played out. All the evidence, all the scientific evidence is that the natural resource base is being stripped. I am not suggesting that we will not, you know, have some genius somewhere in different parts of the world will solve some of these problems. But if you look at fisheries as an example, we have stripped the oceans aided and abetted by technology. Well, here we have a, an Asian neo-Malthusian. I just wonder, Dr. Rajan, Please whether you find him <laughs> convincing. Well, uh, I think we have, we've had, uh, as you said, evidence that somehow technology has adapted. Now, I, I think he's raising the possibility that it will not adapt the next time. We can never be sure. I think we need to take steps to try and limit environmental damage. I think we need to raise taxes on some of these, uh, as, uh, on uh, various forms of energy consumption. The Asians have to be aware of that, they are. But I don't think what you want to do is stand in the way of their aspirations and at the same time also say they have to do all the adjustment while the Western right. world gets a free pass. Well, I think if you force the Western world to also make adjustments, that would be great. Raghu Rajan and Chandran Nair, thank you both for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.